All right. Well, welcome to the fields. Great to have you kick your week off with us. My name is Evan Courtney, one of the the pastors here. I want to thank Pastor Travis and Joy for the opportunity to be able to to share today. But before we uh, continue our series, real quick, I want to uh, let you know Father's Day at the fields is next week. Uh, What we do is we roll out the red carpet for guys next week. So we got uh, special giveaways, uh, food, fun, laughter. That'll be towards guys. And so your job is a great opportunity to invite somebody in your life that's a guy, your neighbor, your dad, your grandpa, your grandkids, whatever that is, use that as a way to get them here to come to uh, Father's Day at the Fields. That's next week. And just uh, kind of a hint or a Kind of a help for dads or buying gifts for dads. Um, we don't want ties. We don't want, you know, we don't want fancy socks. What we want is uh, gift cards, uh, you know, sporting goods tickets, uh, gas cards, actually. Uh, three digit gas cards um, would help. So, uh, but uh, let's, let's continue. Let's get off of that and go towards the Holy Spirit here. To help us. Uh, but this is the second week. Uh, last week, if you missed, you can jump on to YouTube or the, or the website, thefields.church, and, and watch the message there. Um, or I'm going to summarize last week into one sentence. I know those that you were here last week are bummed because you're like, wow, I could have gotten it into one sentence. I didn't need to come last week if I could get both of them together, but it is what it is. And so this week, uh, we kind of recap last week is this statement is God wants to put something in us and through us that is beyond the natural. And that goes to the supernatural. And what that is, is, is the Holy Spirit. And so today what we want to talk about is what does it look like to have our life shaped by the Holy Spirit? And so we talked about last week that the Holy Spirit is, is, this, is this breath. It's, this, it's the breath of God that's actively moving and that he wants to come into our lives. And our lives can be shaped by the Spirit. His breath inside of us. And what happens is when his breath comes inside of us, it transforms the outside of us. So we get changed from the inside out. So we can't try to change who we are from the outside of us doing our own efforts and our own power. But it's only by the spirit that he puts inside of us and it transforms us from the inside out. Uh, 2 Corinthians puts it this way. It says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, whenever somebody comes to have a relationship with God, the veil is taken away. Well, what is the veil? So the veil, if you think of it as a, a physical veil, something in front of your face that you can't see your face, and if you have this veil on, you can't see. Like you're confused. You don't know what direction to go. You don't know where, what to do. You don't know the decisions to make. And maybe you've been there. I've been there. I'm not sure of where my life is, and I'm confused. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil's taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, And wherever the Spirit is, there is freedom. You no longer have a veil. It could be a veil of unbelief or a veil of confusion that you really didn't understand who God was or or what he had for you. And what you did was you did things according to what you wanted to do and not according to what God wanted to do. Because I thought I knew which way was the best way. But I had a veil on. So when I come to him, he takes it off, and then I've got freedom, and he continues on in this. He says, so for all of us who have had that veil removed, you and I, if you have a relationship with God, the veil's removed, and you can see and you begin to reflect the the glory of God. Then it continues and says this, and so the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him. That's the role of the Spirit, from the inside out, to make us more and more like him. So as we are changed into his glorious image, we're not changed into what we want our image to be or what we think we should be. No, 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 no. He changes us into what he wants us to be. And the thing that he wants us to be is his glorious image. And so God wants to do a work that's inside of us, not to transform us into what we want to be, but into what he wants us to be. And the Holy Spirit does that, and that's why we need to live this Holy Spirit-shaped life. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of Acts. And Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament. The New Testament is when Jesus arrives onto the scene. The first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is the story of Jesus. Jesus dies on the cross. Three days later, right, uh, uh, you know, rises from the grave. And now we've got the book of Acts, which is the next book. And it's a, the historical record of the early church. Now Jesus is gone. Now what, the tr- now what is the church going to do? What's his believers going to do? And that's what, what Acts does is it's this picture. And what we see is Jesus' disciples, his follow, his 12 followers, now what do they do is what the book of Acts is. So they're with Jesus for three years performing miracles and, you know, they walk on water and they see what Jesus does. So now we get to see what are these guys really living like. So as they follow Jesus, these guys were, man, they were mistakes. They, they, uh, they were confused. They had anger. They would fight amongst themselves. They, they just could never put it together. You know, they, de- they, they denied Jesus. They, they really didn't believe that he was, you know, going to be able to do the things that he said he was doing. They had this confusion, and they struggled with this. So what happens is, in Acts, we're going to see that what changes is the Holy Spirit shows up and changes these guys that couldn't get it together from the inside out. So the Spirit transforms these disciples, transforms their lives, and now they're full of boldness, and they're performing miracles. So now these guys are living together in generosity, in unity, in care for one another, and they have one vision, and that is to share Jesus across the world. So all of a sudden, the Spirit comes in, changes their lives drastically, and we see different guys because of the results of what happens in Acts 2. Several decades later, Acts 11 shows up, and here's what's happening. is this. It was at Antioch, which is a city, that the believers were first called Christians. So what happens is the work of the Holy Spirit is so strong in their lives that people begin to look at them and they call them Christians. So what is Christians? What Christians means in the original language is little Christ. So it means the work of God was so strong in them that when other people saw them, they were like, hey, you remind us of somebody. Who... who, who was that? Who was that individual that lived, you know, 30, 40 years ago? Who was that? You remi- that's it. You remind us of Christ. You're like a little Christ. Yeah, that's what we're going to call you guys, little Christ. So that's Christians. That the work of the Holy Spirit was so strong, transformed them so much that they look like Christ. And that's what God's goal is for today. Is in your life, in my life. The work of the Holy Spirit didn't end with these disciples, but he continued it. And that's what God's goal for your life is, is to help you to become little Christ or become Christians from his Holy Spirit, from the inside and out. That's God's goal. It's not by our own efforts. It's not by our own strength. It's not by our own might, but it's by the power of his Holy Spirit. And so when I was a... Uh, when I, growing up, I, we actually, we went to church, and we'd go to church most Sundays. And uh, when I was in elementary school, we were going to, I grew up in Springfield, Illinois, and we were going to this church called First Christian Church Disciples of Christ. It's a fairly long name, uh, but it was a good church, and we, I didn't have anything wrong with the church. There wasn't anything that I disliked about the church. Not the, the church was like this really old Gothic building, and the, the congregation members were very, you know, uh, were what I thought were very old at that time. And so here I am as a sixth grader. When you become a sixth grader at this church, as you went through a class, a series of classes, and so at the end of this class, you accepted Christ. It didn't matter if you followed Christ or not. Hey, you came to you came to the last class. Now is your time to accept Christ. And so I accepted Christ. And the next week, I was water baptized. And the next week, I stood before the congregation. I, be, I became a member of this church at sixth grade. Also, what happened was I became a part of this team that I, I don't know what it was called, but I, I would put on this robe and be, at the beginning of service, I would actually walk down the aisles and I had this kind of this brass uh, candle holder, but it was, this, it was this candle lighter and I was one of the candle lighters and at the beginning of service, I would walk up the aisle and I would, I would light all these candles on these candlesticks. And, and then also I was, uh, one of the things that I haven't really told a lot of people about is that I was in uh, a, a handbell choir. 
So a handbell choir, you know, like the, the handbells like this, and I had to wear the special gloves, and, and so I was actually a part of the handbell choir, and you might actually see me in a couple weeks actually up here. I'll bring my handbells up here. We'll do a little handbell choir. We'll come in at the right beats. Uh, but yeah, I was, a, I was a part of the handbell choir, and so then what happened was when, we got, when I got into junior high and high school, my parents were like, hey, you have a choice. Do you want to go with, do you want to, here, let me put it this way. They said, do you want to get up early? Drive 25 minutes with us to go to church, um, or did you want to? Did you? Or I, they probably said, "Did you want to go to church with us, or did you want to not go to church with us?" I interpreted it as a 13-year-old to say, "Did you want to get up early, drive 25 minutes with your parents to church, or did you want to sleep, sleep in?" And so I chose the spiritual thing, and I, I, I slept in, right? And so uh, that's what I did. And so then I began to, like, there was answers that I was looking for as a middle schooler or a junior high, or that this church, I couldn't really find the answers, and I, was, I had insecurities or fears, and I wasn't sure where my life was going. And so as a middle schooler, I, I looked for those answers in, in friends and in relationships and in sports. And I wasn't very good at sports, so I leaned on the other two. And so that's where I was trying to figure out my answers of life, of like, what am I supposed to do, my insecurities, how I'm supposed to act. And so what happened is when I was a junior in high school, in the fall of my junior year, there was this, there was this girl that I thought was cute, and she invited, me, she invited me to this church service, similar to what we do at, for shift, that was all for students. And so I show up to this place on a Wednesday night and, and kind of, you know, I didn't have the, the church history now in high school. And so I walk into the service and it was, you know, 20, 30 students in there. And as I walk in, kind of everybody turns around and look and they see me and they're like, what is he doing here? Does he, does he know where this place is? And so as I come in, I begin to see them interact in the way they're kind of their lives and they're treating one another. And I'm like, you know what, whatever they have, I want like, there's something in here, something in this room, something in these kids' lives that I want. So I remember the, the, they, they kicked off the service, and how they kicked off the service was they, they took a VHS tape as a, of a music video. And so I don't have time to explain what a VHS tape is, right? Like, I, I, don't even know, I don't even know how to get into it. I don't even know how it works, actually. I don't understand all this film, and you roll it up, I, I have no clue. But So there was this VHS tape with this music video, and they kicked off the service, kind of like we do with the clapping. But, but this was of a, of a band that was popular, that they liked, that they were jazzed about, that they were excited. It was this new music video that was coming out that they had never seen before, and, and it came in the mail on this tape, and they put the tape in, and it was Jesus Freak by DC Talk. And I mean, these kids are screaming, and they're going wild, and I'm like, have these guys not seen MTV? Like if he's, and so I was, I was a little confused. I'm like, okay, the, these guys are different. Like, and they're excited, and then worship happens, and hands are up, and hands are clapping, and hands are like, I'm like this in the back. Like, oh, my gosh. Like, I didn't have a watch at that time because I was a middle schooler. But I'm like, I didn't have a phone either. Um, but it was like, man, what, when is this thing going to be over? And so I, I did that the whole time, and then the message happened, and I sat in the back with my arms crossed, and I don't remember anything that the pastor had said. And then at the end, he had everybody stand up, and he talked a little bit, and then everybody came to the front except for one person. It was me, and I was just kind of standing in the back like this. And then I remember he said, hey, does anybody in here want to have more God in their life? Come on up. I'm like, dude, you don't have to say come on up. They're all up here. You can't say, does anybody? I'm the only one in the back. You could say, hey, Evan, I see you in the back. Do you want to have more of God in your life? You can come forth. <laughs> Joker. And so he says that, and, 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 and I'm like, I do. So I put my arms down as I walk towards the front, as I walk down the aisle towards the front, and just inside of myself, I said, God, I just, I want whatever you have for me. What do you have? So as I walked down to the front, I didn't lift my hands. I didn't say anything verbally. I just stood there like this. The youth pastor came over to pray for me. And at that moment, I just began to feel this guilt and this shame and this weightiness just begin to lead me. And then I felt the presence that I've never felt before as God just begins to baptize me with his Holy Spirit and fill me with his spirit. And just, his, just all the shame and all of that just kind of releases in my life has changed forever. 
man, it just, I just remember going to school the next day like a different person, like a different kid. And, and I, was ta- I took my Bible to, to, I found some Bible at my house and I took it to school with me. And every moment that I could get at in the class, I'm, trying, I'm like reading my Bible and people are saying things to me like, well, hey, what are you? What are you doing? What are you? And all this sort of stuff. I remember one class, a, a kid picked up my Bible and, and I was reading it before class. He picks up my Bible and stands in front of the whole class and he goes, hey, thanks to, thanks to Reverend Evan here today. I didn't know it was prophecy, but I thanks to Reverend Evan here today and he opens the Bible we're going to be reading our daily this is before the teacher got in the class and he begins to read scripture I'm like this is so crazy this kid is reading scripture before class because I brought the Bible in so all of these begin to happen and, and here's the thing is that the the spirit began to shape my life and my life began to change and so my question is to you whether you're at the front end of Christianity and you've been in Christianity or today you're you're frustrated and you're feeling guilt and you're feeling shame is I want to let you know that God wants to do a great work in your life and it's through the Holy Spirit is what he wants to do. Galatians 3 says it this way. It says, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit is what he asked. Then, it, then he answers this. And he goes, of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed. The message heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? And what he's talking about is, did you receive the Spirit based on your own effort, based on the things that you can do? And he's like, no, 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 no. You didn't, you didn't do it based on your own efforts of what you could do, of what strength you could conquer up. The only way you could receive this is based on what you believed. And then he continues and says this. He goes, after starting your new lives in the Spirit, after following after Jesus, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? So after you're a Christian, why are, you, why are we continuing to try to, to, to follow after God with our own energy, with our own might, with our own strength, with our own effort and understanding? He says, no, it's not by our human effort, but by my spirit. So my question is today, I want us to answer is this, is how do we live a spirit-shaped life? And I'm glad you asked because I, thought I brought three answers with me. The first one is this, is let the Holy Spirit reveal. Let the Holy Spirit reveal. John 16 says it this way. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin. And I want to just stop right there and I highlighted convict because I read convict and you, you thought I said condemnation. Condemnation means uh, uh, disapproval, punishment. So it means that if you hit your sister, you're going to get punished by going to your room. Not that we've ever said that in my house. But, uh, okay, that's, that's what you thought I said, but I really said convict. Because condemnation is the enemy's word. And so what condemnation is, is, is the wagging of the finger in your face saying, you did wrong. You're not good enough for God. People, people don't know what you did last night, but if they did, they, they, they would know that you shouldn't be here today. You're never going to be able to make it in life. The thing that, the sin that you've been dealing with for the last 15 years, you're going to deal with it for the next 15 years. And that's what the enemy is. And that's, that word is condemnation. Okay? That's not what this is. He says when he, when he comes, he will convict. He's talking about God. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, talking about Jesus, that God will convict not condemnation. Condemnation is the wagon. Convict is this. It means to, uh, it means to allow you to him to, to come in and to provide victory. Or the word means with victory. And so this is a word that means to reveal. That God wants to reveal. That he wants to show. And so when I think of the word convict, I think of it as like a black light. Have you ever played like Gone someplace and there's a black light. Maybe it's a, a black light uh, putt putt range or or you know some kind of paintball or you've it ended up in some concert or like a bowling alley and they got black light. What happens? Like you look at yourself and you're like, well, I thought I was pretty put together until the black light came on me. And you got all this fuzz on you. You saw maybe the the bacon cheeseburger dripped on your pants and you got like you're like I look like a disaster. So what does the black light do? What the black light reveals. It reveals, and that's what he's came to do, is he wants to reveal some things in your life that he doesn't want there anymore. So convict means he wants to reveal things, some things, but, but God just doesn't reveal some things in your life to reveal them. No, he wants to convict you. He wants to provide victory with victory. He will provide victory 
of the world of its sin. He wants to reveal so that you can get rid of it, so that you can have freedom from it, so that you don't have guilt anymore. That's the reason he came to the cross, was to destroy the work of the enemy. He wants to reveal so that you can have freedom from it. The Holy Spirit will reveal areas of sin in our life, and the Holy Spirit will re- reveal the path we should take. So having a Holy Spirit life is he's coming alongside of us to help us to reveal sin and to reveal the path we should take. Does anybody need to know today the path that they need to take in life? Relationship I need to have or, or job I need to have or you know, where to spend my finances or, or what to do with the health concern. We all need God to show us the path we need to take. Isaiah puts it this way and says, your own ears will hear right behind you. A voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether right or to the left. And that voice is the Holy Spirit because he wants to reveal to you. So in response, here's what we do is this, is Psalms 139. Okay, God, your job is to reveal. Search me. Point out anything. Our prayer is, Holy Spirit, show me. Show me those areas. Reveal those. Not condemnation, but victory. So that those can be out of my life. So the first thing to have a Holy Spirit-shaped life is we have to let the Holy Spirit reveal. The second thing is this, is we need to let the Holy Spirit refine. Look at your neighbor and say, you look fine today. There you go. Make sure it's your own spouse, right? That's good. Didn't hear any slaps, so that's good. Acts 2 says this. It goes, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And here's what happened. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone was present, uh, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. And so we had highlighted what is this tongues of fire? Well, whenever the Holy Spirit, a lot of times the imagery with the Holy Spirit is, is fire and it's represented by fire and it's attached with fire. And so what refining is, of why we want to allow the Holy Spirit to refine us, is refining is the process of taking a precious metal, putting it to the fire, and the fire then bringing about the imperfections inside of that metal and bringing them up to the top so that they can be revealed and taken away. And then that precious metal is more refined, it's more pure, it's more blameless. Now, does the fire, does flames heating up hurt the metal? Well, I mean, have you ever touched a piece of fire? Like, or not a piece of fire, but have you ever touched the flame, been next to heat? Yes, it hurts, right? So when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and he's going to refine some things, he's going to bring some imperfections out, guess what? There's going to be pain involved, yes. But at any time, but at the end result, you're going to end up with this more holy and blameless metal or this holy and blameless life. So what we have to do is our job is to stay in the process and allow the flames to come. 1 Thessalonians says it this way. Don't stifle the Holy Spirit or don't tell the Holy Spirit, hey, get out of here. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit, your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. So stay in the process. Allow him to, to continue to process, continue to refine your life. God wants to make you holy and blameless. And we have to stay in the process. We have to allow that work to happen. So here's what happens in our life. Your life and my life were, is filled with these imperfections, right? So if we look at some of these imperfections, so here would be the imperfection of uh, whether you're, you've been a Christian for a week, whether you've been a Christian for 10 years, whether you've been a Christian for 80 years. All of us have imperfections in our lives. And if you don't have an imperfection, then that is your imperfection, right? You got lying imperfection. So, uh, but I always have, you know, there's, there's greed in here. Uh, there's lust. You know, there's, there's selfishness in there. You know, there's, there's, there's theft in there. There's Facebook posts in there, right? 
all those imperfections in our life. So here's what happens is this, we have these, this is our life and we have all these imperfections. And when we come to the, the Holy Spirit and we say, Holy Spirit, refine me. What he's going to do is he's going to come in and the Holy Spirit is going to pour into your life. And he's, he's going to refine your life and pour into your life. And as he refines, he's going to continue. And what you're going to see is you're going to see these imperfections. So you may do it once and say, Holy Spirit, come into my life and refine me. And then the next week, you need to come in and say, you know what? The, the process isn't done yet, right? There's still these imperfections. So Holy Spirit, come in and, and refine me and change me and bring more into me and pull your grace onto me and fill me with your spirit. And what he's going to continue to do is he's going to continue to pour into you and he's going to push out. He's going to refine you just like those metals. All those imperfections are going to come to the top and he's going to continue to, to push them out. So that's what we need to do is we need to... is we just have to stay in the process. We have to allow him to pour his spirit into us to push those things out. So here's our prayer with this one. Is Holy Spirit change me. Reveal. Reveal what these are. And then you've got to come in and you've got to refine me and you've got to change me. You've got to push these out of my life so I can be holy and blameless. And then the third thing that we have to do so we have to let the Holy Spirit redeem. What redeem is using something that we thought was useless and turning it to useful is what redeem is. And it reminds me of the story of Paul. So Paul was this character in the Bible, a, a real-life guy that um, he was trying to climb the religious ladder of his day, not following after Christ, but following after the religious sect. And he was trying to do everything in his own might and his own power to climb up this kind of corporate ladder. And he, he would push down anybody that he could. He was, he was full of anger. He was full of greed. He was full of just his self. He, was full of, he had control issues. He was actually an executor of Christians which meant he would oversee Christians being murdered. That was his job. And he would murder Christians himself. So a horrible, bad dude. He even called himself, he's the worst of sinners. If you find a horrible sinner out there, he goes, I'm worse than him. So here's what happens. Is that there's a story of the Paul, a real story is he's walking down this road or he's traveling down this road. And what happens, all of a sudden he has this counter. He has this interaction with Jesus. He has this interaction with, with the Holy Spirit. And his life is changed forever. And, and it says his life was radically changed. Because God was speaking something to Paul that day that God is speaking to us today is that God has always wanted to do something in Paul's life and but Paul was going down the wrong path Paul always thought he was supposed to do this but he was supposed to do something else see he was a murderer of Christians but God saw something different for his life and he wanted to speak that over Paul's life to say you know what there's something different for your life I want to redeem your life and turn something that you thought was bad and I want to turn it into something good Acts 9 says it this way it says but the Lord said go for Saul, that was his name before he became a Christian. Now it's Paul. He is my chosen instrument. Paul, I've chosen you. I want to, it was an instrument, something to be used. Paul, I want to choose you. I choose you to use you. You are my chosen instrument. That's what God is saying to you today. Is I want to use you. I want to, I, I, I have chose you. I chose you. I don't care what you've done in the past. I don't care what you're doing right now. I don't care if you're murdering Christians. I choose you and I want to use you as an instrument. I see something more in Paul. I see something more in you. I've got great plans for your life is what he's saying. But to do that, we have to be redeemed. Paul was heading down the wrong path and God set him on the right path by his spirit. He's a chosen instrument. I think about it here at the Fields Church, we talk a lot about taking next steps. We always say, hey, we've got to get into a group. And getting into a group is great and building relationships with other people are great. But the reason we want you to do that is not for that relationship, but for what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you while you're in that group. We'll talk about, hey, we want you to get into growth track. It's not about going through the three steps of growth track. We feel like if we can get you into growth track, it opens you up so you can say, Holy Spirit, come inside of me and redeem me. Make me useful. 
You know, we don't have volunteers around here. We call them our dream team, and they serve the church. And yes, they do amazing things for the church. But it's not about the things that they're doing for the church. It's about the things that God is doing inside of them while they're serving the church. We don't need you to serve. You need you to serve. So the Holy Spirit can transform you from the inside out. So our prayer is this. Holy Spirit... Use me. Use me. Back to 2 Corinthians where we started. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him, not like ourselves, to change us into his glorious image. Let's stand up, and I want to do two prayers today. The first prayer is this, is that if you feel far from God today, if you feel like there's a barrier between you and God, I want to let you know that that God is knocking on your door today. God doesn't want your religion. He doesn't want your effort. He doesn't want uh, by your own willpower. It's about a relationship. And you might be the one standing in the back with the arms crossed today. God is knocking on your heart. And today, if you want to say, you know what, God, I I need a relationship with you. If that's you, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, you can pray right where you are. You can pray inside. You can pray verbally outside, however you want to. But let's pray the prayer to allow God to say, you know what, God, I want to have a relationship with you. Let's pray. God, today, I realize that I've, I've gone my own ways. I realize that I'm separated away from you, that I've got sin in my life that I need you to come in and take care of. I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you rose from the grave. I want to have a real relationship with you. Come into my life. The second prayer is is for those that are followers of Jesus. This prayer is the, the prayer of allowing the Holy Spirit to shape your life. It's the prayer of asking God to show you. Holy Spirit, show me. What are those things that you want to reveal? It's the prayer of, Holy Spirit, change me. Maybe he's revealed some things to you. Maybe he's he's refining you, and now you need to ask him to change you. And then the third prayer of, Holy Spirit, use me. Use me as your chosen instrument. Let's pray. God, today we, we come to you and we ask you to fill us with your spirit like we've never felt before, like we've never experienced God, may it be like a a mighty storm. May it be a tongues of fire as we read about in Acts 2 where it changed these individuals' lives forever. God, do your work in us. God, our prayer is today that you would reveal some things, that your Holy Spirit would come in and that you would would show us areas of life that we need to change. God, areas of life that we need to get out of us, God, so we can become holy and blameless. God, not for ourselves, but for you so that we can be a a mirror, a reflection of your glorious image. God, and we pray, show us and use us. Use us as your chosen instruments, God. May we be used by you in mighty ways, God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit.